Will you point it at me, please? All right. So, can everyone out there hear me? If you can hear me, classrooms, just type it into the text chat. Just checking to see if everyone can hear. Wonderful, thank you. We're going to get started here in uh, in about two seconds. Actually, right now we're going to get started. So, um, Lynn's going to walk out and introduce you to everybody. There's Bryce Simmons. Hi, friends. There's Croy McCoy and Christy Simmons Pattengill. They are the scientists. And there's Paul. You guys met Paul earlier. And Hal's out there. Hi, Hal. For tech. And then there's Ivan. Hello. And um, we're about to take you underwater right now for our first live underwater video feed of Gruber Moon 2016. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Bryce and Christy. Christy's going to hold the camera. Bryce is going to put, or just talk into the mask for a minute. That's right. And can you, Todd, can you hear me okay? I, we hear you fine. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Sorry, it's kind of funny. I have to talk into my mask because this is where my microphone is. So while I'm going on the dive with you today, we're going to jump off the back of the boat, and I'm going to have this mask on my face. And for the whole time I'm diving, I'm going to be able to talk with you with the microphone that's inside of my mask. And if all goes according to plan, uh, it'll be interactive. So you guys will get to, through Todd, ask me questions about things that you're seeing or questions that come up based on what I'm saying, and I'll be able to answer those with you. Uh, we're at Bloody Bay Wall. It's one of the most famous and well-known dive sites in the entire Caribbean. Really, really beautiful dive site. And during most of the year, there are Nassau grouper and large, big fish all over this wall. Right now, there are very few Nassau grouper, and the reason for that is because most of them are out at the spawning site. But we may get lucky and find a couple out here. While I'm diving, my dive buddy, Croy McCoy, who's a research scientist with the Cayman Islands Department of the Environment, is going to be coming along with us. He's going to hang out with us, and also, if he finds something that's interesting, he's going to point it out so that I can show it to you and talk about it. Okay, so with, with that, I'll turn it back over to Todd, and Croy, myself, and Christy are going to get ready to jump in the water and go for a dive, and of course, Lynn, who you're not going to see, but you've probably met before, so, all right. All right, everybody, good to see you. So, um, Christy and Bryce are right now getting all their gear together uh, to go underwater, um, and take you guys down on to one of Little Cayman's famous dive sites called Bloody Bay Wall. Specifically, we're going to be on uh, Randy's Gazebo is the name of the, the dive site that we're on. And we just sent a couple of divers down ahead of time to check it out, and they said it was full of amazing and beautiful things. And um, what I'd like you guys to be thinking of for the next few minutes while, while we get into the water are maybe some questions that you might have, and we're going to follow the same um, format that we had before. Just one second. <laughs> so we'll be toggling back and forth between classrooms to share questions with Christy and Bryce, who will be underwater. Um, teachers, remember to send your, you know, when you're ready for a question, just send that to the web chat box, and then I will line you guys up and let you know when we're ready for your questions. And uh, now we're going to take this camera out, and you're going to see them go get in the water. Here we go. So, so you guys. So you can see there, everyone's out on the boat, getting their gear, getting ready. There's Lynn Waterhouse. She's one of the Scripps Institute uh, graduate yep. students. And say hi. There we go. There's Croy getting his face mask cleared up and ready for the dive. You can see that we have beautiful conditions out there today. It's and actually, if the uh, that Tammy there is holding the camera, Tammy, you want to point it at yourself? Point it at yourself. <laughs> There's Tammy. She's a she's a student who is uh, working with the Department of the Environment, and she's she's a cameraman right now, cameraman. Um, and then Cody right there. Cody, you want to wave at the camera? There's Cody, who's also also here with the Department of the Environment. You can see Bryce there is getting all of his stuff together. 
He's got more gear than James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why don't we, yeah, there you go. So you can see Croy's about to get into the water, and Lynn is getting all of her stuff on. You guys don't get off the door. You don't want to have to All right. So we are, right, you can see it's, a little busy hubbub up here uh, top side as we get everyone into the water. Um, can you point the camera at Bryce so they can see his mask there? So if you see Bryce's face, he's wearing what's called an AGA face mask that allows him to breathe air underwater and still be able to talk, which if any of you, um, if any of you have uh, dived before, you know that you have to have a regulator in your mouth which allows you to breathe. Well, this allows him to breathe without having that in his mouth. Bryce, do you want to test out your uh, audio? Yeah, go ahead, Todd. Uh, can you hear me now? We hear you great. Okay, great. So I think I got this mostly set. I'm going to tighten it down a little bit. And uh, as soon as I'm ready, we'll get going on this dive. Hope you guys are having a good day today. Hope the weather is as good there as it is here. We've got a great day for diving, my friends. We're going to find some pretty cool stuff down there. I'm certain of that. So, get on my fins. So, as you can see, Christy is already down in the water, it looks like, as is Croy McCoy. And now Bryce is going to go in and show us what there is to see on Bloody Bay Wall. Okay. So, first step in this process is I jump in. You can hear that. That was a different sound, right? Now I'm breathing air exclusively off the tank that's on my back. Then I can do this and talk to you just like I am now underneath the water. So here I go. We'll take this as a pointing stick. Away. Okay, so I come up. We'll get the camera to Christy. Then we could be ready to go. Okay. Let's go for a dive, you guys. Here we go, everybody. Down we go. So while we're descending, it's worth talking to you guys a little bit about how scuba diving works. As I sat up on the, on the deck of the boat, I can do this because I've got all the air I need in that tank that's on my back. That tank is connected to this mask through this thing which is called a regulator. And every time I breathe in, that regulator takes air from my tank and gives it to me here in the mask. Hey Bryce, what are all those cords you're carrying there? Yeah. So diving requires a lot of equipment and even more so when we're doing education dives like this so that I can talk to you. This big yellow set of cords connects my mask and my microphone up to the surface and into the boat so that it connects into the computer that Todd has got. This black line, that's the video cord. So we stream high definition video to you guys in the classroom so you can really get to see all the cool colors and beautiful fish that we're going to get to see. Okay. So, didn't take long for us to get down here. We're at a site called Randy's Gazebo on Bloody Bay Wall. Now this site, it starts right around 18 feet, so we're pretty shallow here as far as diving goes. But if you just look over the edge out here, you see how it's just blue? Well, I tell you what, if you go out that way, not very far at all, you're going to be over a thousand or more feet of water. So it's a very sheer wall, and that's one of the things that makes Bloody Bay Wall a very special dive site. And you know, it's not just special for divers, it's really a, a special site for reef biology, and that goes from corals and algae right the way up to fishes and sharks. And this place is a really an epicenter of biodiversity, not just in the Cayman Islands. 
But in the Caribbean in general, what I mean by that is there's a lot of different kinds of species, different kinds of fish and corals, sponges, all right here on, on Bloody Bay Wall. It's a really special site. Now, Todd, I'm going to go ahead and keep talking, but go ahead and interrupt me at any time if you need to. Okay, Bryce, we're actually going to take a really quick question, so uh, let's see if you can hear it. Hold on. That okay, sounds great. Okay, so we're looking at Renaissance School of Art and Reasoning out in Sammamish, Washington, and I believe we have a question from Inbar. Inbar, can you stand up and ask your question? Say hi, Bryce. Hi. There you go. Uh, so I have a question about the air. Bryce, can you hear her? I cannot. Could you relay that to the question? Um, oh, hold so on one second. Inbar, hold on one moment. Let me see if I can get you uh, live. I'm going to actually ask him your question myself real quick, and then we'll come back to you while I figure out the sound for that. <laughs> Inbar's question... Uh. <laughs> and the corals, you can really start to understand how this, this reef system is very, very interconnected. One moment, Bryce. So we have just got back online. I see that we have Mitch Tibbetts' classroom. We have uh, the classroom over on Cayman Prep, Mr. Burke. We've got Ms. Wall's classroom. So we are ready to, ready to keep going. All right. That sounds great. Todd, do you want me to keep talking, or would you like uh, to get some questions? Why don't you talk a little bit about what you see, because people are literally just getting on right now. That sounds good. Okay. So I was just... Uh, just chatting with uh, with you guys, and maybe some of you weren't able to hear it, but we'll we'll reiterate here that the, the reef community on Bloody Bay Wall is very very interconnected. So all of these different species of fish that you're seeing, they're all related to each other, either in terms of predator or prey or how they interact. And so you all know, here, I'm pointing at some uh, brown chromis. And those are the small little guys with a white spot on their tail. And those guys are plankton pickers. So as plankton washes up out of the, out of the deeper ocean and up onto the reef, these guys are the first line of mouths that that plankton hits. And these guys feed on that plankton that washes up. And they, in turn, feed the grouper and other larger predators like jacks that are here on the reef. And so there's this process of moving energy, food, and nutrients from the ocean water onto the reef system itself. And you can see that. Oop, there goes a predator right now. You can see that happen in real time as you do a dive here on Bloody Bay Wall. Okay, so Bryce, we have our schools back online, and they were not able to hear your answer uh, with regards to how much air you have in that tank. Okay. Uh, the upshot is I have about two hours worth of tank of air in my tank at this depth, which is about 30 feet. More or less. If I were to go down much deeper, I would have less air, or I'd be able to stay down a smaller amount of time, because the further down you go in the water, the more compressed the air gets, and the more air it takes in order to take a breath of fresh air out of the tank. So, if I was at 80 feet, or like 80 or 90 feet, let's call that 30 meters, I could only probably stay about eh, 30 to 45 minutes. So Bryce, I see a lot of life down there. Could you point out some of uh, what you see there that might be an indicator of a healthy coral reef? Sure, yeah. So, uh, uh, in case you guys didn't hear it, I was talking about the connectedness of uh, all of the species that live here, making this a, a really, really a web, a community. And we had talked about plankton. I'm going to show you a a tiger grouper, that's a, that's a predator right there, and that tiger grouper, he's pretty small, he's probably not uh, reproductively ready to go to the spawning site yet, so he's, he's still young, but once he gets big, turns into an adult, he'll probably be going out to the spawning site just like Nassau grouper, and uh, he's just one of the many different types of predators that exist on this reef structure. Now, predators, of course, will eat fish, but they'll also eat crabs and crustaceans. And we talked about uh, plankton wars. 
being really the types of species that bring food from the water column onto the reef and really integrating it into the reef uh, community. And things like tiger grouper will, of course, eat things like these uh, brown chromis. And here's a blue chromis and uh, blue head wrasse. So all of these guys are, are connected in how they work together. And I should also say it's worth pointing out that part of making a healthy reef is having lawnmowers. And it turns out that if you didn't have fish that ate algae, plants, then plants would be able to outcompete corals and even sponges. And so you would end up end up with a uh, with with a reef that has only plants on it. But you throw in several species of lawnmowers or herbivores, like blue surgeon or uh, blue tang, excuse me, here's one right here. That's a blue tang. Bryce, we have a question from Cayman Prep, and the question is, does the majority of the spawn happen uh, at night or in the day? Oh, and I see a NASA right there. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, Christy has found a nice friendly NASA grouper. Obviously, this guy hasn't got the message that it's time to go out and spawn. But someone needs to tell him that the party is a little ways away. Just say again. <laughs> Someone needs to tell him where the party is. Exactly, yeah, he's, he hasn't got the message yet. He's quite keen to get a, uh, get a little snuggle from Christy by the looks of it. That's pretty funny. <laughs> but these guys really are like puppy dogs, you know? Hey Bryce, we've had this question before, and I'm wondering if you might be able to answer. Um, a lot of the kids were, were wondering if the Nassau grouper is an apex predator, which a barracuda would be, or a shark. The barracudas and sharks aren't known for being super friendly. Why would a Nassau be friendly like this? Yeah. Great question. Well, of course, we'd love to believe that these guys are friendly just because they are. They want to hang out. But in reality, Nassau grouper, and several different species of grouper, are actually really, really intelligent. And it's uh, they're very plastic in the way that they hunt. And what that means is that they they can come up with all different techniques for catching their food. And one of the techniques that they use a lot is a technique called nuclear hunting. And what they'll do is, well, if they see an eel snaking in and out of the reef, they'll go up and they'll follow that eel, believing that eventually that eel's going to scare out a fish. And then we will uh, grab that fish and have a meal. Well, they do the same thing with us as divers. They get nice and close to us as divers. And we think that they're here to get petted. But of course, they're just hanging out because they believe eventually we'll probably scare out some squirrel fish out of the reef. And then they'll, they'll get a nice meal out of the whole deal. I see. So we have another question uh, from Olivia at Renaissance School of Art and Reasoning. Um, her question is, are the tiger grouper as rare as Nassau grouper? Yeah, great question. You know, uh, tiger grouper that have not seen as much of a decline throughout their range as Nassau grouper have. And part of that is because tiger grouper don't uh, get together in such high densities as Nassau grouper do. So when Nassau grouper take it together, they form this very, very dense pocket of fish that, you know, historically could have been tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand fish in a very small area. Tiger grouper don't do that. They go to the spawning site, but they have a different uh, way of, of setting up at the spawning site where the males will defend the territory. And there'll just be one male on one you know, large coral area, and it'll chase away all the other males, and then it'll maintain a harem of females. So there'll be a bunch of females that choose to be with that male. So if you get that distributed over the whole spawning area, the density of tiger grouper is not very high, and so it's much more difficult to fish them out. And that's, I think, why there's a big difference between how hard hit Nassau grouper have been compared to tiger grouper when it comes to fishing on spawning aggregations. 
I see. Now, it looks like Christy's showing us some different types of corals there. Can you point out some of what you're seeing? Sure, yeah. So, uh, there are many different species of coral out here on Bloody Bay. And she's showing you the coral. She's also showing you a little uh, cleaning gooby there. And I'm afraid even if I put my hand up there slowly, you might even come clean it. We'll get lucky. Uh, he might not be hungry. Sometimes I can get him to clean my hand. And I don't want to touch the coral. This is actually, it looks kind of like a plant, right? But it's not. It turns out that each one of these little bumps here is a separate animal. And they live together essentially like in a condominium, where each animal is right next to his neighbor. But they're clonal. But that also means that each neighbor is essentially like a twin of its neighbor. So they're all essentially the same, but they're separate animals. They have their own separate gut system. But these guys also are neat because they do two things. They can eat plankton that gets caught in their tentacles because they look essentially just like a, a sea anemone. But they also have inside of them zooxanthellae. Now zooxanthellae is essentially uh, a type of algae. And those algae that lives inside of that animal gives them energy. So they can get energy from the sunlight through that zooxanthellae or through the plants, as well as getting energy by eating the animals out of the water column. There's different strategies for making that happen, and that's why you get so many different species of coral. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to tell something to the classrooms. It looks like while Bryce is underwater right now, you're going to have to type your questions into the chat box. When Bryce comes back up out of the water, we'll be able to talk to you guys and engage one-on-one -on -one back and forth. So if classrooms have a question, please go ahead and type those into the group chat, or you can ask your teacher to type the question into the group chat for us. Uh, you guys, oh, here, Christy found another, uh, uh, another species of grouper. This is actually a, a red hind. This uh, uh, species also goes out to the same spawning site as Nassau grouper. And this guy probably should be out there now, so I don't know what's going on. Maybe he's just taking a break. That's the way biology works. Uh, have things been a little bit different this year, Bryce, with regards to the spawning? Yeah, great question, Todd. They sure have. Uh, we were certain that this this year, this month, January, would be the big month for spawning. Not, uh, but so far, the fish haven't been cooperating. They have other ideas. So, well, there would typically be, I don't know, somewhere between four and 5,000 Nassau grouper out there. Uh, there's been far less than that, maybe just a thousand. And it, okay, uh, we have another quick question. Um, the question from... That, <laughs> oh. that Nassau grouper didn't like the red hind being there. He, he wants to have all the attention. Can you explain <laughs> what's happened there, Bryce? Well, sure. Uh, the Nassau grouper on their home reefs, well, they're territorial, and they'll go ahead and defend their home reefs against other like predators, make sure that they're keeping all the food for themselves, right? Because uh, the more food you get, well, the more healthy you are, the faster you grow, the more babies you can have. Now, when they're out at the aggregation site, well, they don't do that because they're, they're there to have a mate. But when they're here at the home reefs, they'll fight off all the other predators in order to maintain uh, all of the resources that are right here just for them. And that NASA grouper didn't like that red hind being there and making use of some of its resources. Yeah, we can see that. So the question from Hannah at Renaissance is, uh, she read somewhere that there are some groupers that are so big they might be able to swallow a diver. Is that true? <laughs> well, I suppose it's possible. You'd have to be a really small diver. <laughs> You'd have to be a really large and very hungry grouper. But in all honesty, no, I, I really don't think that that's possible, probable, or has ever happened. But it's kind of fun to think about. It's like we like, that's why we like movies like Jaws, right? 
Right. So what is, what is the biggest grouper, Bryce? Well, it depends on what ocean you're talking about. But right here in the Caribbean, uh, the largest species of grouper would be the Goliath grouper. And that species of grouper that can, can live uh, up to 60 years or more and can get to be somewhere between 6 to 8 feet and closing in on 6 to 800 pounds, possibly more. So very, very large. Uh, and, and those uh, individuals also form spawning aggregations, uh, although there's not as many of those around either. In fact, Goliath grouper, like Nassau grouper, are listed as uh, threatened under the I, excuse me, endangered under the IUCN Red List criteria. So they're not doing well either. All right. Thanks, Bryce. The next question from Paige is, uh, to make their mouth large, do the groupers unhinge their jaw? They've seen, they've seen video where their mouths got real big. Yeah, groupers are not like snakes. They can't unhinge their jaws. But they do have a very specialized jaw mechanism. And it gives form to a particular kind of feeding mechanism called gape and suck. And it, what it is, is the jaw of those things is so powerful that they open it so fast and wide that when they open it up, all the water in front of them gets sucked into their water, into their mouth very, very quickly. And that process sucks in whatever's in that water. And so they can essentially suck in prey just by opening up their jaws fast and very, very wide. Yeah, great question. Excellent, right? So I see around you some uh, some other types of uh, biomass down there other than just hard corals. Can you point out some of the other things that are below you? You bet. So we talked about corals. There's also another animal on the reef uh, that we're seeing lots of right now. And those are sponges. Now here's a tube sponge right here. Now this is also another type of sponge. And we've got big barrel sponges. And these guys are also uh, filtering animals. And so they bring lots and lots of water into the sponge, and they push it out as it as it's comes through their body, and they filter that water. And that's how they feed. But they look a lot like coral. They grow, uh, they grow on the hard substrate just like coral does. And there's a big diversity of sponges here on Bloody Bay Wall. And they're very, very pretty. Ah. Who eats those sponges? Ah, great question. Well, probably the biggest consumer consumer of these sponges are turtles. Yeah, we we actually get quite a bit of turtles out here in the Cayman Islands. Uh, haven't seen any yet on this dive, but I'm still hopeful. Okay, we have a couple of questions up. So the first one uh, from Victoria is, where is the most common place to find a grouper other than the aggregation site? Uh, yeah, Christy is showing you, this is a barrel sponge. I'll answer that question, Tom, but I just wanted to say that Christy is showing you a barrel sponge, and on that, she's got a banded cleaner ship in here. You can just barely see the, uh, the antenna on it. And these guys, there's a couple of them, actually, and they'll clean fish that come up to them. Ah, and here's a lobster, too. Here, Christy, take a look at that. See the lobster? It's a Caribbean lobster. So lots and lots of fun stuff going on on the reef here. So, Regarding that question, uh, uh, places like this, healthy reefs, are a really good place to find a uh, grouper. Assuming that the area that you're in has a good fisheries management plan, that if they've allowed grouper populations to stay at a healthy level, and not necessarily don't catch them, but allow them to have a healthy population level so they can continue to reproduce. And if you do that, like they do here in the Cayman Islands, you'll have uh, lots of grouper to see on home reefs. Great. Now, uh, Mr. Burke at Cayman Prep, uh, their question is, how are grouper adapted to their environment? How are grouper adapted to their environment? Well, you know, I feel like we've been talking quite a bit about lots of different adaptations they have. So let's uh, just take that opportunity to recap. Uh, behaviorally, they're adapted because they're very, very good at taking advantage of what's around them. They use us as divers to, to find and catch prey. Well, even though we don't want them to, they're good at it anyway. They do the same thing with moray eels and sharks. They've got a gape and suck mechanism, so their mouth is adapted. 
They're going to fucking pray when it gets close. And they're adapted to defend their territory and maintain as much of the resources as they can so that they can grow up big and strong as quickly as possible and make lots of new baby groupers. So they are a perfectly adapted animal for the particular role that they play on Caribbean coral reefs. Wonderful. Now, we have another question from the Towering class, which is uh, Joandy would like to know uh, about how many groupers are there now out at the aggregation site? Yeah, right now, there's probably a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred. On a, on a year where we know they would all be out there, which we thought this was the year, but or this was the month, but maybe it's next month, who knows? Anyway, when they're all out there, there's more like Four to five thousand groupers, so four or five times as many as there are right now, and that's only at Little Cayman. Uh, there is no place else in the Caribbean or anywhere that we know of that has that many groupers, not even close. So this place represents really, truly one of the the last areas that has a large, healthy spawning aggregation for this species. Okay, and another question we have from Ava at Renaissance is, what is the typical depth that Nassau groupers are most often found? Well, during the year, this is the spot to find them, right around somewhere between 15, 20 feet, right the way down to maybe 60 to 80 feet, but they're typically not that much deeper than that. And so it turns out that when they go to that spawning site, that's usually the, the time of the year when they're deepest of all. And you can find them down to 160, even 200 feet, but that's quite rare for Nassau grouper. The species doesn't typically live on home reefs that deep. Yeah. Excellent. And then we have another question from Sophia, which is, uh, are Nassau grouper monogamous? Ah. Are they find a, a mate that they're with their whole life? Yeah, uh, they are not monogamous. They they do not find a single mate and stay with them for the life. There are many species of fish that we believe do uh, have monogamy. So they find a they find a mate and they stay with them on the whole reefs, like angelfish, butterfly fish typically do that. So you always see the same two fish together wherever you find them. That's why grouper don't do that though. They defend their territory from all other Nassau grouper, male or female, except during spawning time. And during that time, they don't just have one mate, they get together with thousands of them. And that's a good thing because it allows them to have a lot of mate choice where they can, they can look around and find out which mate they think is perfect for them at that time in their life and at that location. Great. And we have another question from Aubrey at Renaissance, which is, how many different species of fish are in the, or of, na of grouper are there uh, where we are now? Uh, in the world? I believe the question was exactly, how many species of fish are in the area you are in besides the Nassau grouper? Ah, okay. So, uh, here at Bloody Big Wall, if you were to do a dive and try and find as many fish as possible, over the course of using up your tank, uh, you might be able to find 90, 95 species of fish. Now, there are a lot of fish that, as a diver, we're going to have a really hard time finding because they're up deep in holes. They're very, very challenging to spot. So, even though we might only see 95 species of fish, there's unquestionably several hundred species of fish, probably as many as four even 500 species of fish in the Cayman Islands. So a lot, a lot of fish. And that just goes to show that they're all part of this, this reef community, which is very complex. And it has to be in order to mean that many different species. Okay, and we have another question from Javon. Uh, and his question is, um, how exactly do the groupers spawn? Yeah, so, well, uh, they all go to the uh, west end of the island, here, anyway, or the spawning aggregation site, and when it comes time to, to spawn, the females are, they have these giant swollen bellies that are filled with eggs, and those females release their eggs at the same time.
time that the uh, real group were uh, releasing their sperm. And those two pieces meet uh, after they're released to the broadcast spawners. Which means that they release that all into the water and all mixes together. It ultimately turns into the eggs and then the new baby grouper. And so about 35, maybe as much as 40 days later, those eggs hatch into larvae. And those larvae settle out on, on the reefs of the Caribbean. And you get more baby grouper. Now Christy's showing you here a, one of the favorite grouper foods. This is a, a long spine squirrel fish. And you can, you can see how these are red, right? they got really big eyes. Christy's actually showing us the coral there. Oh, she is? Okay. Now, now we see the squirrel fish. Here, I'll just tilt it up a little bit. There, can you see that? Yes. Okay. So you guys saw he was red, and he had big eyes? So, the reason he's got big eyes and he's red is because he typically spends most of his time out at night. Now, he is nocturnal, but you guys have heard that word before. And if you're nocturnal, and you're adapted to being nocturnal, well, it pays to have red coloration, because red, as a, a, a wavelength of light, filters out very quickly in water. So essentially it looks like black, but there's not a lot of light in the water. And you have big eyes, because it helps you to see at night. So just more evidence of being adapted to their particular role on the reef. Excellent. And we have the next question from Maisie is, um, uh, are there lots of grouper there right now? She's surprised that we're seeing some uh, on the reef and not at the aggregation site. Do you have any answer for that? Yeah, so typically, not during spawning season, we would be seeing maybe, I don't know, five, ten grouper over the course of our dive, maybe more. But that grouper that you saw earlier was the only grouper we've seen so far. That's encouraging because it means that most of the grouper that are on these home reefs are somewhere else. And one presumes that somewhere else is out at the spawning site. Great. And the next question from uh, Jaslyn would be, uh, how, how long uh, do groupers live? Well, depends on the species, but in general, they tend to become reproductively active, or become an adult, let's say, somewhere between five and seven years of age, but this is really for Nassau grouper, and it's not uncommon for them to live 25, 30, uh, maybe even a little more than 30 years old. We don't really know for sure, because you know, we, don't, we don't have data from a population that hasn't been fished. But it's not hard to believe that a, a middle, medium-sized grouper, like Nassau grouper, could live to be about 40 years old, although most don't. Most are in the 20 to 30 year old range. Is that a long time to live for a fish, Frank? Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a great point. These, it doesn't seem like that long in human years, right? But for a species of fish, it's a pretty long period of time to live. Now, there are some fish, uh, not in the Caribbean, that live uh, many, many decades, even more than 100 years, and that's a really long time to live. And even species that live 30 years, however, present a challenge for fisheries management. And the reason is because they don't grow very, very fast, and if you overfish a population, it takes a long time for that population to recover, to come back. So you have to be very careful when you're managing a population of fish that are long-lived. Because if you make a mistake, well, it can take decades to get that population back and healthy again. Okay, and so Camille's question uh, uh, dovetails nicely with that. On a healthy reef, how many Nassau grouper would you want to see? Uh, great question. I don't know the answer. <laughs> you know, when we started this project, there was... Maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand Nassau grouper out of that spawning site, maybe. And now they're closing it on five thousand, so we've almost, let's call it triple the population uh, since we started. And we don't know when it's going to stop growing. Uh, there's lots of evidence to suggest, though, that it can handle many more uh, individuals than are out there now. And so I think uh, a healthy population 
We be seeing Nelson Groover very regularly on a dog site like this. Here Christy is showing you another predator. This is a bar jack. And the reason he's sitting so still right now is he's trying to get clean. Uh, there's a species of fish out here and in shrimps. That they're, they're, the main way that they make their living is by cleaning parasites off of other fish. So it's like a car wash. The jack pulls up, sits next to a coal head, and here come the cleaning fish and shrimp. Come out and they pick all the, the clams, or excuse me, all of the parasites off of the off of the, the fish that's getting service. That's pretty cool. So there he goes, he took off. Okay, and our another another question from Nicole is, what is the most common type of grouper uh, here on Little Cayman? Yeah, common type. Uh, and Tom, this is going to be the last question, and then I'm going to head off, okay? Sounds good. Okay. Uh, probably the most common uh, species of grouper here is a small grouper called the Graysby. And uh, Graysby, as far as we know, don't go to spawning aggregations in order to reproduce. They just stay around in their home reefs. But they're small. They're only about that big. They don't get much bigger than that. They're very well adapted to live on their home reefs here. So you see them quite commonly. So that's probably the most common grouper. Hey, listen, it was really great talking with you guys. I really enjoyed it. I had a wonderful time. And we can say thanks to our uh, oh, My dive buddy's just above us, so we won't worry about that. And we'll say bye to you. And uh, if we get a chance, we'll talk to you when I'm back on the boat. And if not, thanks for diving us with you guys. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me here. Okay, everyone in the classroom, just sit tight while I switch the cameras to back to the, the one here. And Todd, Todd, you can go ahead and uh, take up the line here. So the line can start coming up. The line's coming up now. Okay, I uh, unplug the acoustic or the sound cable from my from the box, and then I'll unplug this, please. Doing it now. Okay, can you guys hear me okay there? Can you hear me now? All right, so I can see there's a few classrooms there. I'm going to wave to you. There's Renaissance. Hi, hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you might notice um, I'm really sweaty because um, I've been sitting in the cabin of this boat while the boat's been rocking back and forth uh, managing this chat. Um, but it's so good to see you guys, and uh, it's really awesome to see all the other classrooms that are out there. Um, if there is any last-minute questions, I'd be happy to take them. Okay, it looks like Renaissance has a question. Karen? Oh, so you guys, you can run it. Yep, I got Lee. Go ahead, Lee. Okay, so um, have you ever uh, seen fish, uh, like, eating another fish? Uh, can you say that a bit louder? louder? Have you ever seen a fish, like, feasting on another fish, like, attacking one? All right, so the question is, have we seen a fish feasting on another fish? And we see that all the time, yes. Uh, in fact, the last time we were here, uh, one of the dive shops rescued a grouper from the aggregation site that had been attacked by a shark. So that will sometimes happen at the aggregation site because there's thousands of fish all together in one spot, and those fish happen to be really tasty to another predator like a shark. So sometimes they are attacked, but often when you're down uh, diving on the reef, you'll see you'll see fish eating each other or at least trying to eat each other. Good question, Leif. Do we, have, do we have any other questions? Yep. You said that you expected that this month would be where the spawning um, happens the most, but how do you know that? Yes. Well, we only, good question, uh, Karen. We only know that based on what they've been doing for the last 14 years that they've been uh, working on the project. So. According to what has happened for the last 14 years, this full moon should be the full moon that they all show up for and spawn. But that hasn't been the case so far. So far there's only been maybe 1,000, 1,500 fish that have shown up, and we should be seeing closer to 5,000. However, the divers that are, went that up this so we're still waiting to see what happens. Perhaps more are showing up, and, and we're keeping our fingers crossed 
that we will actually uh, have some spawning that will happen, uh, you know, maybe tomorrow or maybe Friday. Good question. Are there any other questions? Hey, um, what sort hey, of, um, what sort of, slash, um, slash amphibians <laughs> slash reptiles live in the reef? Good question. So, uh, actually, um, while we were out here this this, after, or this this morning testing out the equipment, there was a large hawksbill turtle that swam right up next to the boat. Um, so we see turtles pretty regularly out here. Um, also, on shore, we see a lot of iguanas, and I took some pictures of some that I'll post uh, on the blog for you guys to see. And there, there's an indigenous uh, uh, lizard here that's about this big. Uh, the, uh, the locals call them curly tails. I'm not sure what the, the real name is, but they're really cute. They look like a sort of larger gecko with a curly tail, uh, and we see those a lot. And now I'm going to let you guys say hi to Christy Summons. Hey, everyone. Hi. hi. Good job. Hi. <laughs> Hi, did you like that? Did you like that? Yeah, yeah it was fun. It was beautiful down there. We got to see a lot of different um, great creatures. That lobster was really nice. That was a large oh, lobster. It was a big lobster. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the question that Andrew just... Oh, okay, go ahead, Mary. You can ask your question. Uh, why are they called Nassau Grouper? Oh, that's a really great question. There's a place in the Bahamas called Nassau. It's a city or an area, and um, I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm assuming that they were probably originally described in that area. Nassau grouper were very common all throughout the Caribbean for, for decades, uh, centuries. So they were probably widely spread, but very common in, in Nassau in the Bahamas. All right, great question, Mary. Are there any other questions down there? We can take a couple. Uh, yeah. Um, are um, NASA grouper diurnal or nocturnal? Ah, great question. They're um, they're they're active during the day, so they are not nocturnal. So at night they hunker down. They hunker down and sleep. Yep. Okay. Good question. Any, um, um, so okay. We got we got one more. All right. We'll take one more question and then we're gonna say goodbye. Yeah. Okay, we're Tom. Go ahead. Is there, a type Loud. Of, oh, is there a type of grouper that's small enough to hold in your everyday, like, household aquarium? Oh, um, well, grouper are in the family of sea bass. So there's, I don't know if you noticed on that dive, there were those little purple and yellow fish that are, are everywhere. Those are called fairy basslets. They're actually, well, they're, they're not anymore, but for a long time they were in the sea bass family. And there's little tiny sea bass. So I suppose there are some, not the grouper. The grouper are all pretty big. But in that family of sea bass, there might be some that you could maybe keep. But they're pretty hard to keep in, in captivity because they are predators. They're not going to eat. Um, they're going to be pretty picky about what they eat. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, you guys, so much for your great questions today. Say goodbye yeah. to Bye. Bye. And uh, remember that we will be back online tomorrow with another dive from the aggregation site with thousands of Nassau grouper. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. See you tomorrow.